The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Um, so, hello everyone, also from my side. Um, nice to see so many familiar faces, uh, not faces, but names here. Um, <clears throat> um, my talk today is about textile interfaces. And um, yeah, let's quickly directly jump into the topic. So why should we even consider um, looking at text textiles for user interfaces? And one thing, one reason for that is that I can't imagine a future where we don't use textiles in any way. So we are wearing textiles all the time with us uh, in, in the form of clothes. And also probably when you look around, you will see a lot of textiles in your environment in the rooms. So textiles are more or less everywhere. And also textiles and fabrics have a very, are very interesting because they are very customizable. Uh, they have a lot of different properties. We can change the shape, we can change the texture of, uh, of uh, textiles. They can have different thicknesses, they can be stiff, they can be stretchable. And this makes them optimal to adapt them to many, uh, many application scenarios. So how can we use them for computing? So one example you will find in many research papers is that you can use textiles for shortcuts. So instead of taking out your phone and for example, skipping to the next song or selecting a playlist, uh, use it for navigation and so on, you can include this into textiles. Um, so one example, for example, <laughs> is the um, project Jakar, which uh, shows an application scenario where you include textile sensors into your bag. So in the bands of the bag, um, to, for example, um, I think in the video they show how they um, kill all electronic devices in a house, but you can also, of course, use it, for example, for music uh, applications and so on. Um, also, textiles have a much larger input space than we are used from, for example, touchscreen devices of like our smartphone. So textiles are graspable. You can take them in the hand and can do certain gestures. For example, here you see an image from a paper from Kara et al, which was uh, researched at our chair many years ago, already a decade, as I can see, um, where they investigated how the folds you can create with textiles can be used for continuous um, inputs. And we don't always only have to focus on input. We can also use textiles to output something. And um, here I wanted to show you a paper of Albo et al, um, which showed how to realize this with machine netting. So they um, used a machine netting, which is industrial standard, and showed how you can prototype with this. And with this, you can prototype very quickly different prototypes. Uh, different fabrics. And then after, again, doing some manual uh, stuffing, you can create uh, three-dimensional objects, which you will see in some minutes can be actuated. So one thing you should look at is that there is are always some strings going out of the object. Um, and they uh, created the different objects in a way that when you pull on those strings that the object moves. And in their research, they uh, did not only show examples, uh, but they more or less also showed how extremely you can create movement and deformation with this. So for example, here they filter this, uh, this, those objects with different filler materials um, to create different kind of motions. And they also use different ways of embedding those strings you can pull to create different uh, to create uh, different motions. And also some example applications are shown in this paper. For example, here they add some plastic sheets into their uh, knitted fabrics to create um, a shield for a lamp, which can move if you need more light or less light. And the last example they show is that you can also use those textiles, actuated textiles on clothes, which adapt very well to the design of the cloth itself, but 
can give you another way of communicating, for example, that you have a notification or so on by letting the text file tapping you. Who this was very difficult because you did not hear that, but I had all the time music in my ears because I forgot to uh, mute the video. <laughs> um, okay, but now this is the only example I will show you today about how text files can be actuated. It is quite recent work and quite interesting work. Um, it was definitely um, in at Kai 2019 in Glasgow was something which was very well visited in the demo sessions there. Um, another reason or application where we can use textiles is what I will focus in my research and my talk later on a bit more is that we can use textiles as universal input devices. So if you think about your home and the current trend for smart home, we have many computing devices uh, in our home. For example, lights, we have fans, we have vacuum robots, we have TVs, PlayStations, and so on and so on. And at the moment, the only way we can control them is uh, yeah, using remotes or voice. While voice is often working very fine. It is not suitable in every, uh, in every scenario. I think that you can, you don't always want to shout to Alexa when you're watching a movie or when you're in a deep talk with someone. And remotes have the disadvantage that they are not bound to a certain location. So putting controls where they are needed. So for example, in my living room, I could imagine the sofa as such a place um, would be probably a nice idea. Um, also some, uh, the reason why you see the iPhone there is, first of all, it's also remote control, but also the, the, um, the trend to control the smart home using the smartphone is quite nice because you can do a lot of things with a smartphone and you can uh, show complex UIs there. But the problem is that the smartphone is a very private device. Um, usually people don't like to hand over the smartphone to other people and let them do whatever they want to do. And this creates the problem that the control of such devices is often not available for everyone, but uh, only for the pe person who is setting everything up. Um, I'm not quite sure at the moment uh, where this exactly comes from, but I know that there are research papers which call this the Google, uh, the Google principle that you have one technique of being guru who can control everything and the others have to adapt to the situation somehow. And well, with textiles, you can try to, to yeah, overcome this problem a bit more by, by adding, for example, the controls directly to the controlled device or again, as at the point where you're usually at in a room. And here, this is also then the first work I want to present to you, which looked into this direction. Uh, they uh, Brauner et al. in the paper Interactive Furniture presented um, several textile controllers and they wanted to see how are those accepted by the uh, by the people. Um, again, this is also research that happened at our chair, um, or at least with people from our chair. Um, and what they did is, yeah, they, they presented participants uh, several different controllers. Here, the one um, uh, you can see is one which has an extra fold you can move. And uh, as you can see, the controller um, looks pretty similar to an armchair, which is their target device they had in this user study. And um, the user could change the setting of this armchair. So the height, for example, for the leg rest or the, uh, whether the back rest is yeah, more, more straight or you are more in a lying position uh, by touching inside this fold. So when you touch inside this fold from the top, um, then the leg rest, for example, moves upwards. And if you do this on the other side of the fold, it moves downwards. Uh, with the fold, you can also do more than touching. Uh, so another controller they uh, showed to the participants was uh, one where you move this fold and bend it over to one direction to create the same movement of the chair. Um, the third text and last text controller, uh, Brown et al. presented to the participants is, um, let's say, less invasive controller. This is a controller where you only have the chair um, indicated as uh, symbolized with those four strings. And when you touch one of those strings, um, 
the uh, the researchers could identify a capacitive signal and the armchair moved into the particular direction. Uh, for example, here in this case, it would the, the leg rest would go up. And finally, they compared this to the standard we have at the moment, which is a plastic remote control, which lies somewhere in the area um, you where know, you have four buttons to achieve uh, the different sitting arrangements. And in their study, as I mentioned, they looked a little bit about, uh, on the acceptance of the participants. Therefore, in their study, the participants uh, first had an introductory survey where they mostly collected the demographic data. Then the participants were brought to this chair and they were allowed to explore the controller. And um, then afterwards, they had to perform some example tasks, so bringing the leg rest up and down and the back rest uh, too. And during all of that, they had to think a lot such that the researchers could get an idea of how the participants liked that. But nevertheless, in the end, participants were also asked to fill out some questionnaires um, and to, to get some measurements for the uh, some measurements for uh, several properties and um, yeah, the uh, subjective opinion of the participants. And the questionnaires which were used here are the UE key and the TEM scales. Uh, um, they use particular scales of those questionnaires. The UEQ is the um, user, user experience questionnaire, which is a lot about the pragmatic um, quality of the controller. It's about efficiency, perspic uh, perspic perspicuity. <laughs> and uh, the dependability of the controller, what the participants thought about that. And the um, TUM is the technology acceptance model uh, where the uh, authors were mainly interested in the attention to use, which is the scale for the perceived usefulness and the ease of use of the controller. And what they found out is that, first of all, the plastic remote was the most practicable uh, one. So this was the one the participants were used to. They uh, were not surprised of the interface. They could handle this pretty well, and it worked as intended. Nevertheless, uh, comparing this to the other um, fabric controllers, uh, the intention to use score there, so the willingness to use the controller was lower than for the fabric controllers. And here is a quote from the paper, and I wanted to, I, I liked the formulation here, so I decided to quote this, um, about the opinion of the participants, which that says that the participants valued the spatial and physical closeness for the interaction surface to the target and the intimate relation between textile controllers to the environment which they control. So it was, the participants liked that the controller was where the tag, where the seat is, where the chair is, and they liked that the controller had the same look and the same uh, texture and feeling like the device they used with that. Looking at the uh, different uh, the different interaction techniques, the participants liked the folding interaction a lot. So the one where you bent over the fold to one direction to control the chair. Uh, however, when it was about the visuals, so the aesthetics, um, the participants preferred the one where you only had those four lines um, to control the to control the uh, chair because of it, its subtlety. And furthermore, the one the one I presented the fir uh, as first to you, where, where you touch inside the fold, that one was the one which was very confusing for the participants. They did not understand the this way of input uh, at the first time, um, which was sad because this was the approach where the authors especially wanted to um, demonstrate a controller which is um, avoiding accidental input. Okay, um, after this, and we have now the first insights into that um, textiles might be a good candidate for controllers in the environment. I want to show you what input we can do with textiles at the moment. And there, Parsat all presented at RISC uh, 2017, a very interesting smart fabric with which they showed a lot of new input gestures, which is the smart sleeve. 
And before we talk about the gestures that there, I quickly want to show you how this smart sleeve you see here on the bottom is built up. Um, it consists of three layers. The top and the bottom layers are fabric which have <clears throat> which have conductive lines on top. So when you touch those brownish lines you see here, and then um, this is registered, and by um, by orientating the both layers in a way that they are orthogonal to each other, they could pretty good um, measure the location of a touch uh, with with a sensor. And in the middle, um, there is a layer which is pressure sensitive, uh, such that more deformation could be measured a bit better than just be uh, having touch locations. And then the authors used machine learning to, uh, to recognize the gestures. Um, and therefore, the sensor data you see here on the left um, was firstly um, uh, pre-processed into a force image. So you have measured uh, touch points, X and Y coordination uh, coordinates plus the pressure points. This is what you see on the, on the bluish arrow there. And then they processed this somehow into a force image like you can see on the black arrow. And with some yeah, computer uh, vision magic uh, or um, machine learning magic, they um, used a classifier to identify the different gestures. The very interesting approach here is that they only used the classifier to classify uh, to train nine gestures. Um, and however, they were able to overall um, present 22 different gestures. And this is, was achieved by using further heuristics in the processing to, um, yeah, to derive new gestures from the one the classifier can, the machine learning can uh, recognize. Um, and I now finally want to show you how those gestures could look like. So first of all, I want to show you the, um, the gestures which were recognized by the machine learning algorithm purely which were first of all de uh, deformation gestures where you have gestures like twisting, uh, like twisting, so turning around the fabric, like pushing the fabric or recognizing bendings um, or twirling the, uh, the fabric around the finger, uh, stretching the, the sleeve uh, or folding it or even grasping it. And additionally to this, they also detected to uh, input gestures we are more aware at the current style of inputting, uh, which is simple touch input with once the finger, and they also differentiated the hand gesture. And then what you will see in the rest of the table is the derived gestures, which is mostly gestures which um, especially have motion inside. So for example, you, if you remember the force image you had, they checked how the sand word moved uh, from one frame to the other to see whether we have uh, a swiping to the left or to the right, or whether we shake the grasped textile and so on. But at this point, please don't think that touch and grasping is the only thing we can do with fabrics. This is not the case. Uh, Wood all showed uh, at Kite 22 that we can also do touchless inputs uh, with textile controllers. So um, I see there is a question. I think it's easier if we answer the question in the end of the talk. Thanks. Um, yeah, we were with the touchless input. Uh, there, who at all showed um, that uh, you can easily create controllers to input, uh, to make mid edge gestures, even on clothes. So here's an example where you, for example, uh, Turn off a reminder, or they also show this in this in the home with furniture, where you use those controllers, those middle gestures to, uh, to to do actions on your TV. As you can see here, uh, there there are various of gestures which are recognized uh, by by those uh, by those sensors. And a quick explanation how this works, because was for me kind of fancy. It was an um, um, sensing technique I have not heard before, um, which is they used the Doppler effect. So they have two antennas. You have seen them also in the video before. And um, 
one of those antennas is transmitting electromagnetic waves. And the other one is only there for measuring electromagnetic waves. And when you now move your hand into this electromagnetic field, then um, the, the frequencies that the receiving antenna measures are getting different because of the Doppler effects. And they used this, this change of the frequent measured frequencies to detect different uh, to detect different gestures. And just uh, to make it clear, those sensors are really um, embroidered on visual fabric. This is what, what you see there is, is conductive yarn, but no more electronic were needed than except of course the, uh, the microcontroller to, to create those sensors at least. And most of the paper is about how to create those antennas because it's very important how distant they are from each other, how long the straight parts are, they need to be multiples, for example, of half of the wavelength of the frequencies you send out and so on. So there is definitely a lot of uh, complex things going on, but um, the fabrication itself is not that hard. And uh, just a quick glimpse um, into what gestures they could detect. So they could detect um, clicking in midair, they could uh, detect rubbing the fingers, doing uh, gestures with the thumb on the index finger or draw, uh, drawing specific shapes. And they could also detect complete hand gestures like pulling, pushing, doing a swipe gesture, circles, and uh, also tapping the sensors completely. Um, okay. Um, with this, I think you have seen a lot of different fabrication techniques or sensing techniques and ways to input uh, stuff with, um, with texture controllers. Now what I want to talk about is the interface design for especially non-wearable textile interfaces. So what you have seen before is a lot about sensing techniques or um, fabrication techniques, um, which always have some application examples, but they never show a huge complete system uh, with which people can do complex tasks. And as I mentioned before, I'm very interested in this every, uh, in this research, research field where you put textile controllers to control many devices, for example, in our home um, at once with the same controller. So as we do with our uh, keyboard and our mouse at the, uh, at the desktop computer. And therefore, we need a design language we currently do not have, to be honest. And uh, many researchers tried to give first insights into how those interfaces should look like, um, and they gave their recommendations. So uh, one of the older works I want to show you here is the work by Chalice and Edwards. Um, they tried to create a music notation tool for uh, visually impaired people. So in when you have music notation, you have a lot of symbols there, you have repetitions, uh, and even if you have uh, multiple repetitions, it can happen that during a repetition, certain parts are replaced by a variancy of, uh, of the music played there and so on. And they wanted to make this available for people who are visually impaired and uh, created a device which is called Weasel um, to enable this. And they did this by, um, by adding uh, adding plastic sheets, PVC sheets, uh, sheets onto a surface which can be uh, can be pressed, uh, and the, those uh, plastic sheets are varied in height, depth, and so on to give different tactile responses. And uh, the authors decided in this work to have a very easy visual to haptic mapping. This means that each line there is also represented by a line with this uh, plastic overlays. But for example, instead of making them of different uh, widths, they decided to use a different height of the PVC overlays. And as I mentioned, we have, for example, this repeating parts in music. And uh, if we have this, they've uh, used, for example, a different texture on those PVC overlays to, um, to make this clear for the people. Uh, the whole other circles you see there, so the bigger ones on the left, 
those are control and uh, control buttons for the interface. Um, and by the way, the, the small buttons, uh, the small circles you can see in the lines, I'm not sure, I'm not a musician, but I think this has also something to do with the repetition. Um, okay, so what did the authors do in this paper? Um, they did a, user te did a user test with five blindfolded people, so the people who have vision, um, we just, yeah, they, I think they were glasses, um, but I'm not quite sure. And they also had one participant who was actually blind and all of them were competent musicians. And um, the participants got a step-by-step -step tutorial um, how this music notation looks like and how it works. And after that, the participants got their first task where they were got another, uh, another piece of music with a different notation and they had to explore this um, explore this interface and describe what is happening then also describe the components after this after they achieved this the participants had to change the settings which were most often um, read out well always read out and again explore the music piece and observe the changes they have done with those with those uh, buttons and from that, the authors concluded some design principles, which I want to present to you here. Uh, first of all, they said that you should avoid uh, empty space. That was simply confusing when people touched somewhere and did not feel anything. They were not sure where to go. Um, also, they mentioned that you should provide help for the exploration. So this is some somehow interconnected to the empty space but this all the empty space can also happen on a very small button for example let's say you have a button which is around three centimeter large and people touch exactly inside of that they can they have will have problems understanding that this is a button um, so empty space is meant also for such cases where providing uh, help for exploration means for example yeah you are completely somewhere else and yet now you need to go to the uh, to the area you want to interact with. Furthermore, and uh, the authors mentioned that you should avoid double clicking um, in their interface where the commands and everything was always read out uh, with a sim uh, synthetic voice. Um, this was problematic in that case, um, especially when iterating through many uh, manual entries. And um, another thing they learned is that you should not expect the people to overreach to explore the interface. So in the case that your arm is completely straight, this is the point where people will stop exploring the interface and will say, okay, that's it. If, it's, if there is not a clear hint that it will continue. So try to position your interface and make it in a size such that this situation does not come up. Um, also the authors um looked at their visual to tactile mapping approach and they were very confident uh, that this will not be the most efficient design um, especially in their uh, later suggested um, iteration of the design of the weasel you can see that for example the um, the overlays which had a different height were replaced by um, by overlays which have a certain angle and so on to, to make this a bit more uh, efficient and easy, which also comes to the place that you should definitely try to simplify all of your controls you have for tactile user interfaces. You can't expect people to recognize very, diff uh, very many different um, elements there. Okay, so this was one of the, the earliest paper regarding this I found in the uh, field of HCI. Um, and we can definitely learn and, and use a lot of this information for, for designing our tactile interfaces. However, if you think about the desktop computers and so on, um, you probably will, when you create uh, a, um, a user interface by yourself, you get widgets, you get uh, already pre-created uh, buttons and so on to create your user interface. And this is something we currently also don't have a lot in this area. However, Gilliland et al. Um, 
showed a first uh, approach for this, and they, uh, they presented a textile interface swatch book where they created different widgets where um, which adapt uh, which um, which are derived from interface elements we know from other domains. For example, here you see the Okay, before I go to the example, I'm sorry. Uh, what they else described in uh, in this paper are equipment recommendations. So what threads should you use? What embroidery machines uh, are suitable for creating textile widgets? What needles and fabrics um, can you use? And furthermore, then they presented the widgets, as I mentioned before. Um, and the, the first example I wanted to talk about is, for example, the walker switch. So here, um, instead of having simple buttons, as we know from example, our keyboard, they said, okay, one controller, we have a lot of uh, switches you can uh, tilt. So uh, Kippschalter of Deutsch. Um, so in this example, you, you have to touch one of those um, buttons on the, in the middle, and then you can tilt your hand to either go to one side or to the other side to control, for example, sliders. As you can see here in the image in the bottom right, you have three sliders you can control with that. And uh, which slider you want to control is, by the way, decided by the one of the three um, buttons you press in, in the center. Um, another example they have is, um, is a menu that they showed um, an approach where you have to to touch a base uh, element on the bottom, and then you can swipe with the finger on the textile to, to move the cursor up and down. And also very interesting, I like this approach a lot, is they, in their future work, to be honest, they presented the zipper. So they used a component we know from textiles a lot. I think many of you know this from your pants at least, or from your jackets and so on, which is, yeah, a haptical device you are very used to, which fits into this domain of wearables a lot and also for furniture you find a lot of furniture having uh, having this those zippers like um, cushions and uh, we do use this element to control uh, to know something the lights the this the volume of our song and so on however again those are single examples for different widgets um, but again, when we look at design for user interfaces and in software, we have design guidelines, which tells us how big a button should be, how a slider should look like, and so on. And this is something which uh, Mlaka and Halla did also in their work with uh, the title Design Investigations of Embroidered Interactive Elements on non wearable Textile Interfaces. Um, they exactly looked. How should a button feel? How should uh, how large should it be? What texture should it have, and so on? And this is something I wanted to sh show you a bit um, more in more in a bit more detail. And uh, just to to uh, explain the process, because they had in the beginning a lot of things they could vary. So consider that you can change texture, you can change si uh, size. Uh, you can change um, the orientation and so on. They decided to have, first of all, a brainstorming sessions with senior researchers to come up with statements they want to investigate. However, after this, um, they, they had over 60 ideas. They tried to reduce this to 10 assumptions, but nevertheless, this was still a bit vague, so they decided to have another interview session with experts from industry and academia, so not only researchers, and all of them were from different domains to um, come to five statements they wanted to investigate further. And uh, this, those five statements I want to, to um, present to you too. So first of all, they said that contrasting should be can be uh, can be done by changing the texture, by changing the shape of icons, by changing the height, and in any way, at some point, people will recognize this. Um, they also made first estimations on the size of uh, the size of the uh, buttons and the icons, 
which was um, at least 6.5 millimeters. And they said they assumed that the optimal size will be 30 millimeters, which is approximately the uh, size of your uh, fingertip. Um, furthermore, they said that interactive elements could be curved inwards and outwards, which is very interesting because when we consider again our daily interfaces, most of the time when we have something interactive, it stands out from the base sur uh, surface. And um, they also said that yeah, when, when we change the shape of an icon, uh, this can communicate uh, a certain command. And finally, similar as uh, in the work you have seen before, they said that shapes should be pretty simple. Um, and they did some experiments to, to make investigations in this area. And first of all, they, <clears throat> they um, tried to create contrast with different form factors of fabrics. So they varied the uh, how much the different icons stand out. They varied the chain, uh, the, the shape of the icons, and also what happens uh, in uh, on the left side in C. They changed the texture of the icons and wanted to test whether participants could recognize one uh, one of those elements has been changed in the mass. So you always have this four buttons, and one was changed accordingly with a different type, with a different shape, or with a different texture. The textures uh, they investi uh, investigated were um, artificial leather, loden, denim, and polyester. And the base uh, fabric they used were, was a mixture of polyester and cotton. The author stated that two of those um, textures felt very different, had a very different texture, and two were rather similar to the polyester cotton that, used, that which they used for the other cases. And what they found out was that people had no problems recognizing uh, the different height when the height difference was larger than 1.6 millimeters. And in this case, only one participant of 30 was not able to recognize this height difference. Um, and they had a uh, and everyone recognized the height difference easily with three millimeters difference, so 2.5 millimeters. Looking at the shapes, this was not planned, uh, but looking at the shapes, um, they found that the triangle and the um, within a bunch of circles worked best for the recognition for the differentiation. However, in the end, the design guidelines from uh, from Laka and Hala suggested to use very simply um, to create contrast use um, edge shapes versus round shapes. So also, as you can see, also the uh, circle within the rectangles to the left of my marking there and the rectangle within the circles worked quite well. And for the texture, they've found that this was the most difficult to, to differentiate for the users. Um, However, Loden uh, worked the best uh, in this case. When it was about what of those factors should I now choose to create contrast in my user interface, the author suggested to use first height, then the shape, and then the texture, because the texture was definitely very difficult. In the second experiment, they tested different icon sizes. Um, Again, uh, participants had to recognize the different uh, shapes of different sizes. Uh, those were size of 4, 6.5, 13, and 20 millimeters. And what they found and the uh, shapes were either filled or outlined. And what they found out is that uh, we have a good recognition of the different shapes when this shape size is larger than 30 millimeters. And the authors found that the outline shapes were recognized a bit more than the filled ones, but nevertheless, the difference was very small. So you can see the outline shapes were recognized 293 times, 39 times, sorry, and uh, 206 times uh, in the other cases. So only a difference of 33. And um, finally, since they tested different shapes, they observed that there was no significant difference between different shapes. Uh, the other factors were more relevant. As I mentioned before, curvature was a thing they wanted to look at. And here, the authors just uh, 
gave to the participant this interface where you have um, a button which is where the inner part is outstanding and uh, a button where the uh, inner part is recessed into the base surface. And they presented an application scenario to the users, which was either controlling a car window or the volume of the stereo and asked the participants how they would use the text that they have in front of them, the controller they have in front of them um, to control those devices. And it was not very surprising, at least for me, um, the one which has the filled, um, which the filled inner part was often used to increase the volume or to, um, to, to, to make the car window go upwards. And um, the other one was often used then for the opposite action. However, there were also some participants who refused um, to, to use the, the uh, concave, the recessed button at all. They tried to do everything with the one on the top. So, but this was only, I think, about five people or 30. So overall, the, also the recessed buttons were regarded as interactive in this experiment. Um, finally, about uh, the shape of larger interfaces, as I mentioned, we don't only, only have icons and buttons, but we also have sliders. And Mlaka et al. paid attention what affordance those different elements have. So how do people interact with the triangle on the top, with the circle, with the uh, square? How do they interact with the rectangle and the lines and so on? And yeah, they, they simply gave this interface to the, to the participants and asked them, uh, how, what would you do? And um, first of all, what they found out is that independent of the shape, uh, the affordance of the three things on the top um, was always the same, which was pressing. And what was a bit more surprising, at least for me, was that the least ambiguous one was the one uh, where the finger is in the image, which is this rectangle, because only 15 of uh, 30 participants wanted to use this to slide on the rectangle, uh, eight pressed this, uh, five did suggest to do both, and the rest of that um, simply said, this is not an interactive thing. I would not interact with this. This is just a rectangle. Um, so one of the design guidelines Mlaka and Hala described in the end was to, if you create new textile controllers, be sure that the shapes are not um, are unambiguous so that the all users know exactly what to do with this. And uh, finally, um, <clears throat> and finally, um, in the last experiment, the um, the authors uh, tested different shapes and how well participants recognized those. Here they used relatively common icons like a star, a heart, a phone, and a house, and they, um, by intention, made them a bit larger to, to make the recognition a bit easier. And what they found was that this was also very hard to recognize. Um, the star was recognized most by half of the people, followed by the heart, and then when it got a bit more complex with the house and the phone, this was recognized only by two or three people. So here, the author suggested to use, to combine uh, the shape of such icons with other properties of text size, for example, the texture and the height. So they suggested to use, uh, for, for a button which closes your application, they suggested to use an X form, which has, which is standing out a lot and which has a very stiff surface. I will skip my work at the moment, I'm a bit unfortunate, but I have a video recording of that because what I wanted to present here is more or less my Kai talk I had this year. Um, I will give myself this talk um, as a video and I will also give you the slides and then uh, please look this, um, look this up after this lecture because then I will quickly jump to the end of my presentation such that uh, Adrian can, can continue. So by the way, I did similar research as Mlaka et al did uh, just with uh, the sliders. I looked a little bit more at sliders and I wanted to investigate how the, um, 
uh, how they should look like, whether they should be, let me quickly jump, whether they should be simple paths or whether they should be a closed shape, uh, whether they should be um, um, recessed or whether they should, hello, whether they should be recessed um, or waste. So in this case, whether you feel the, the, uh, the, the, the yarn coming out of the base surface or whether they are create, um, create a concave form factor. And also I did this with, uh, with uh, closed shaped sliders. And furthermore, I investigated several shapes which should help you um, uh, orientating within the slider when you are currently not looking at it. Um, so this was what I did, have done in the, my first user study. And in my second user study, I looked um, after I got some first design ideas how the slider should look like. I investigated when we vary the when we add slide, uh, tick marks to the slider, how the performance changes in, on this textile domain. And also I varied the tick mark design to, um, yeah, to, to help the users orientate within the slider when doing this eyes free. Um, I think the rest will be uh, set in the video I will give to you. Um, therefore, I will quickly jump to my last two slides, which, is this at the first, so what is currently researched? So as you have seen, many researchers about uh, developing new sensing techniques for interactive, uh, for interactive fabrics and textiles. Um, still, we need some help with the design. There are many physical properties we need to, um, we, we need to experiment, experimentally evaluate in this domain. And also when we plan to create more complex UIs, more generic uh, UIs for multiple purposes, many research questions are open, like how can we create a good sense of hierarchy in such user interfaces? How can we facilitate the exploration? How can we add even semantics or in, in the case of you're using everything as a remote controller, how can you even communicate which device you want to control at the moment? Furthermore, when adding textiles to your clothes or to your furniture, um, what might happen is that you accidentally touch those controllers and we at the moment don't know exactly how to avoid uh, accidental activation without reducing the comfort of using such controllers uh, drastically. And furthermore, um, the, uh, the interfaces we have seen uh, the most in this presentation, at least, uh, were very static interfaces. Nevertheless, there is a huge domain in our field, uh, which is uh, working on shape changing interfaces. And there the question is, how can we use them to create more expressive uh, textile user interfaces? And then I want to conclude with some papers which when, which I was not able to uh, describe in this presentation. For the next time, I will add myself to. And um, yeah, this is definitely, this is uh, one, one thing which is uh, very interesting is the one by Hollis et al, which presented more design guidelines for wearable, wearable textiles. I mentioned a pinstrap in the beginning of this talk, which is a very exciting and well-cited paper. Also a bit more current, we have patch O, which used shape memory alloys to create fabrics that can move. And also uh, one paper I discovered during this year's seminar, which is IO braid, which showed a quite interesting approach by making the, uh, the cords which come out of your pullover and um, make them interactive. And they also implemented uh, displays with that. And finally, uh, Google is researching a lot in this area too. One uh, project you will definitely find in any of current uh, papers about smart textiles is Project Jakar, where they created a uh, conductive fabric, which uh, is suitable for the industrial um, fabrication of, tech, of clothes. And also um, rather new is the Zebra Sense, which is just um, a textile controller, which allows you to detect touch on both sides of uh, the fabric. Otherwise, uh, in research, very often sensors were just sandwiched, which make them very stiff and 
which was not that des undesirable. With that, thank you a lot. Sorry because of the missing part. <laughs> I would love to present this uh, another time to you, but yeah, I'm happy for your attention. And if you have any questions, um, do we have some time for this? Yeah, no worries. Are there any questions? There was once a raised hand uh, in the beginning. Uh, I had raised my hand earlier, but uh, this is basically a different, a, a few different things. I <clears throat> I thought about during your talk, uh, just stuff. I wanted to ask if you looked into that, if there's research on that. Uh, we could do that later if we just want to conclude with the other talk first, because it's just ask. really minor stuff. Okay. Uh, one thing I thought about was the durability of such interfaces, because I think like. For example, in households with cats, or like I imagine myself starting to 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 play around with this and pick at it. Uh, I don't know. This this is this seems to be kind of a problem with that. In yes, my that's true. <laughs> oh. um, especially the conductive yarn, which is used in many research approaches, is not that durable, especially when we want to wash it. Um, nevertheless, um, material scientists. Uh, are working on that. And for example, a project Jacquard did also first steps to make those uh, fabrics more durable uh, and also washable. I think those uh, they mentioned this in their talk that um, you can wash them several times without uh, losing the conductive properties of the yarns. But definitely, yes, in research, this was still a huge problem. Uh, what, wasn't, um, there the, wasn't there the, the, the Google jacket or something? Was this, this is from Project Jacket, yes. Okay, cool. Uh, the next thing I thought about was uh, that these input gestures on sleeves could make users seem pretty nervous. Uh, I don't know. I imagine the scenario where somebody had this controller in their sleeves and they uh, controlled like a presentation with that and I don't know if, if if you stand in front of a huge crowd of people, um, does that affect that somehow? Is that um, consideration? I'm honestly not aware a lot about the so social acceptability of uh, those tech sites. This is definitely a step you have with each new technology. Consider um, yeah, wireless uh, headphones, where it was very confusing in the beginning when they were new that people were talking to themselves all the time. and at least now at the moment, it looks just confusing in the first moment. And then you realize, oh yeah, we have Bluetooth headphones and um, uh, you accept this situation. But yes, definitely um, those te such technologies have to adapt if you introduce them to the market. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and third and last one I had was uh, this output stuff that you had in the beginning where the textiles were kind of moving with the threads being mm -hmm. pulled. Um, this reminded me a bit of uh, about Springlets, which I think was a submission to Kai in the same mm -hmm. year even. Uh, have you looked yeah, into, into yes, combining was... these a bit? Um, because this seems to be... Actually, when you look at Patch, oh, this is exactly the combination. Uh, the spring, Springlets oh. um, ah, yeah. was, was using SMAs, so shape memory alloys, which um, move to a certain shape when you put some uh, yeah, power to it. And... Um, by the way, it is correct. They represented both as Kai 29, uh, 2019. Um, and yeah, uh, definitely um, this was also considered for textile fabric, uh, for textiles uh, to use. I also have some plans with that in the future, um, but this is still uh, on work. But thank you for your questions. Yeah, thank you for the answers. Yeah, I would I would say on that note, then let's continue to one of the authors of Springlets. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hello everyone. I'm Adrian Wagner and I'm going to talk about textile embeds in 3D printing and why we even want textile embeds in 3D printing. So you can, if you if you think about the talks you already heard, um, it's a, a little bit of uh, René's talk from last week and some parts from Oliver's talk just now, but I'm going to try to 
condense them into one part and the the actual um, parts where they connect to create new and exciting ways of um, making objects in personal fabrication or in uh, more industrial usage, but we are mostly going to be the, the personal part, as long as the, uh, the um, machines you need are easily accessible. So let's go back to last week when you saw this image or a video of this object being created. Um, you heard about the um, way how 3D printers layer molten parts of plastic, so, so fibers of plastic, to generate these objects. And um, you heard that there are multiple different versions of materials you can use, like uh, PLA or ABS. Um, but the problem with most of these uh, materials you can use is that they have specific and very specific ways that they can be used and they give properties to the objects. Um, one example would be if you would use PLA and PLA is a little bit softer than ABS but still um, and generate an object and you now try to move parts or um, yeah, try to bend them in any way, you will most probably end up with snapping the object. So that is a problem that you have with um, just using one material. You can also use multiple materials, dual extrusion or multiple extrusion. You can change the material. But the problem is that most of the materials that are softer um, just can change their shape, but move back. So it's not like they are, um, for example, a metal where you can bend it, it stays in the bended shape. But you have the, the problems that you have to somehow get in between those two options. So the I can't it's it's less flexible and will break, or the it is um, very flexible, but it will move back. I can't bend it in a specific shape. And that is, by the way, what the shore value of a material tells you. So the, the bendability, what is this one way of measuring it? So in order to get more possibilities into your 3D prints, and I will do a small essay excursion into uh, um, the topic of getting other materials into 3D prints, um, so to, to get a base layer of how they do it. So you can get multi, other materials in there. And most of the research into other materials at the beginning was focused on making 3D printing even faster than it already is. So um, trying to uh, substitute materials that you would print with materials that you can just uh, cut. Or for example, in this paper, I want to go over first um using lego bricks so this is the paper fabric fabrication fast 3d printing of functional objects by integrating construction kit building blocks by muller et al at kai 2014 um, and i will show you the video but i will talk over it um, so what they did was they created the possibility of only 3d printing specific parts and then using the construction bricks to create the rest of the object. They are, they are creating a, yeah, kind of a VR headset here that you can put your phone into. And um, what they did was they created a software package where you can just say, okay, I want specific parts to be more with more fidelity and some parts need less fidelity. So I only use the um, time consuming 3D print for the uh, high fidelity parts or the parts that I want to um, figure out if there is the um, yeah if there's a, 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 if I want to figure out if they fit into a specific um, other part like they they are now trying to generate these holes to get the lenses into and um, later they will also try to figure out how to make it more malleable to the head but you can see that here they now have the um, they're now building their parts. They have these connectors on their 3D print, which uh, connect to the bricks and they're done. And it is very fast because you don't have to print all the parts. 3D printing is fast, 
uh, if you think about how the industry has to have, have to create all the tooling, but um, it is not fast in a way that you want to rapid prototype a lot if you are doing that in a, with say a personal fabrication kind of space. And you see that here, they're creating now these parts, they want to figure out how they fit into the head, uh, onto the head. So this is one way of doing it, of just trying to figure, of just uh, using other parts and substituting the 3D prints. And um, uh, they are doing that uh, here again for more parts, they try to figure out what they want to change. Um, but I'm going to go over to the next part, which is uh, platinum, low fidelity fabrication of 3D objects by substituting 3D print with laser cut plates, where they just substitute everything from Pride 2015 by et al. And they are not using 3D print at all. You're still able to get 3D printing in there. And I will show you part of the video again. Uh, you see here the differences in the timings. But again, they created um, a kind of tool where they can just substitute parts of the 3D print with other parts. And here, this is uh, two-dimensional parts that they can cut on a laser cutter, uh, acrylic or something like wood. And this is more in the direction of what we're going into later because um, textiles or, or fabric are, if they are not used for something like clothing, mostly used when, the, when you work with them in a 2D-ish way. So um, this, is, this is kind of, an, of a way that they are trying to get 2D-ish workflows into um, creating three-dimensional objects. And you see here, they are marking object parts that they want to 3D print and other parts are getting cut out. This is, uh, this is the acrylic way, which is the more rigid kind of way, um, but they will uh, show in the later part of the video how they are doing this for um, something like wood, where you can cut slits that make the wood more malleable, which you already um, saw in kind of a way, the talk of René last week, where he showed cube. But cube is a different kind of approach where they are starting from basic building blocks and try to create an object within the um, way that the tool can work with it. And here they are going from a high fidelity object and the tool generates something that is more low fidelity. Uh, you can see that here now where they um, just use uh, uh, heating to generate the bending or uh, right after that, the part where they use the wood to uh, generate the bending. Yeah. So, and again, it's a, it's a VR headset that they're trying. So yeah, this is the part where they show the, 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 how you would, it, would do it with wood. And this is also what you could see in cube in kind of a way. The problem is, that our world and especially in nature, there is not just an object that is created from one kind of material or one kind of rigidity. And if you're working with different kinds of rigidities in your uh, materials, you're getting into um, the direction of making um, composites in kind of a way. I choose the image of a, of a leaf here because that is a, good example for uh, yeah, an object in the world that has some kind of a rigidity to well uh, stand off from the stem, but also needs to be um, light enough and uh, malleable enough so that air can go through it or um, that um, multiple of these can be on the same space on the tree. So um, you need a mixture of features for most things that you see in um, and, and around our world. You can achieve that by getting into more of a fabric kind of um, yeah, material uh, feature. And uh, I want to show you two papers that try to achieve that with just using 3D printers. And with just using 3D printers, I mean, um, 3D printers, which might be a little bit changed up, um, which is the 
which is what happens in this paper. Desktop electrospinning, a single extruder 3D printer for producing rigid plastic and electrospun textiles from Rivera et al. from Kai 2019, where they try to generate um, kind of a felt feeling fabric from basic 3D print materials. And I will show you the video. So what they did was they enhanced the 3D printer by using the uh, electro spinning possibilities, which I will talk about uh, on the next slide. But this is just extruding a small fiber of the material, 3D print material, and um, getting it to bond to itself in the kind of the way you would bond felting, by well felting. You could see that they could only print in um, on the the basic layer, so on the on the on in two dimensions because they have to they can only do that in the in the dimensions of the print bed, but the interesting part is and this is why I stopped on this um, image, it actually has some of the um, features that you only think fabric would have, but we are already yeah doing creating our fabric from plastics. So this is uh, not that special, but it is actually absorbing liquid here. And you can use that to sense something. And this flower opened when it was sprayed with a kind of a water mist. So how are, how are they creating this? Uh, the interesting part here is that they uh, this is what electrospinning in the basis works like, but they um, changed the normal 3D printer to do this. So you have the polymer like PLA, standard 3D printing, um, but you want to extrude it in a way that it gets very fine. And the idea here is that you extrude with very low extrusion rate and the electrostatic forces of a high voltage ground and a high voltage power supply on the print bed and the print head respectively, uh, will generate um, a pull that pulls small threads onto the print bed. And you need around five to 50 kilowatts of uh, voltage for this. So uh, very high and uh, dangerous in some kind of ways, but um, you generate an interesting uh, kind of uh, texture with just having a normal 3D printer with some small additions. And the interesting part of the liquid absorption that you can sense and another thing is just like normal fabric, and we all know that from wearing our jackets outside, um, which are mostly water resistant, you can just uh, coat it um, with something like uh, a coating that makes it uh, like a piezo sensor so that you can, can get resistive, resistive sensing. Of course, this is not the only way of doing it. 3D printed fabric techniques for design and 3D weaving programmable textiles from Takahashi et al. at WIST 2019. They are trying that in the vertical direction. I will show you the video. Um, so what they are doing is they are printing a frame so that they can weave uh, the extruded material around that frame. You can see the frame here in blue. I will show you an image later. And this is the final uh, text, so final uh, textile fabric that they create. And you can also, they also enhance it with electric components, conductive material. This is, by the way, very standard that um, you show how strong it is and then you show what you can do with it. So many papers will do this. Um, let's look at how they are actually doing it and what the possibilities are. So you see the blue, which is um, the whole structure that they are printing um, around. And the pillars, so the small blue pil pillars is what gives the, the structure which they can weave around. The interesting part is, well, I mean, height and length, they of course can change depending on the print bed size and the print volume, but interesting is that you, you can change the adhesion between those fibers and the adhesion to the pillars because you can remove the pillars or you can let the pillars be uh, stay there so that you get more of a rigidity or less of rigidity um, can be done by changing the print speed um, or the heating uh, of the printed material. And the density can obviously be changed by changing the distance between the pillars or the fibers. 
what you have to keep in mind is that you can only use materials that create a stringing effect. So you need to be able to print uh, some mid, in midair at some points. And this is not possible for uh, all the 3D printing materials. So they are restricted in a way. But this is another way of creating something like a fabric. But why, if we can create fabrics like these in 3D printing, why would we go to something like uh, Oliver just showed us? So um, the normal or the, the, the fabrics we already know, the, um, the woven fabric, the knitted fabric, uh, um, because the woven parts almost always show 2D workflows here, but Ol Oliver also showed the knitting paper by Alba et al, which they had these uh, knitted structures that they could fill manually. Um, but I will talk about mostly 2D possibilities that you get by using a workflow that has been created way before 3D printing and is way more matured in that way. I will start with um, two papers that use that in an interesting way. Like, uh, one is Sketch and Stitch, Interactive Embroidery for E-Textiles by Hamdan et al. at Kai 2018. So what they did was they created a way of just using the 2D workflow of drawing to make it possible for a novice to create um, a 2D embroider texture and electric circuits. I will let them talk for themselves. Sketch and Stitch is a system to quickly and iteratively create e-textiles with an embroidery machine. You draw your artwork and circuit on the fabric. To add electronic components, you use our circuitry stickers as placeholders. Sketch and Stitch uses computer vision to turn your design into embroidery patterns. After embroidery, you replace the stickers with actual components. There are also stickers for creating touchpad sensors on a single layer of fabric automatically. So, like I said, more possibilities because a more refined workflow, better suited for beginners, you're getting in the direction of making it way easier to use two-dimensional workflows in a possible three-dimensional application when you combine these with the possibilities of 3D printing. Another way would be um, this paper, Knit UI, Fabricating Interactive and Sensing Textiles with Machine Knitting by Luo et al. at Kai 20, uh, 2021. And what uh, they did was they knitted multiple layers, which now have the possibility of sensing specific interactions. And I show you that paper, and I will also let them talk for themselves later. Um, I will show, I show you that paper because they are actually showing this on 3D objects like gloves or 3D, 3D surfaces like gloves, um, socks, and uh, the like. We present Knit UI, a machine-knitted textiles user interface based on resistive pressure sensing. We design and fabricate a double-layer sensing structure using conventional conductive and knitting yards. It is deformable, portable, and washable, requires minimal manual post-processing, and can be integrated into existing knitting garment designs. We offer an interactive design interface, investigate the sensing performance with varied design parameters, and demonstrate a diverse set of application scenarios. Okay, I stopped it at that frame because here you can see it very well. Um, the armband, the glove, the socks, um, 2D workflow in the software, 3D applicability. So how do we get from these 2D workflows to getting a 3D print-like workflow to create 3D objects? Um, the easiest or the, 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 I think, more direct way would be to um, just use something like yarn to create layers, like we would use molten PLA to create layers in 3D printing. And this is what um, Hudson did in Kai 2014. Um, it's like felting in a way to create uh, 3D objects. So you can see that here. Um, it is really just working like a three-dimensional sewing machine. And it does not exactly work like a 3D printer in that it puts layers on top of each other, which it does, but it also has to kind of entangle it because they don't bond otherwise like a molten plastic would do. 
but in the end you get a 3d object and you can even because you can have cavities or some uh, some open uh, enclosed uh, spaces you can put other stuff in there like parts of uh, plastic parts that you could 3d print the other way of um, of more or less going more in the direction of doing this uh, 3D printing layer are, um, kind of way is a layered fabric 3D printer for soft interactive objects by Peng et al. at Kai 2015. Um, what they did was they actually did uh, created a fabric layer that they could slice to like they like you would slice a 3D object in um, something like Kuva. Uh, for normal 3D printing, you can see that here. And then they create these layers and they bond them to each other like plastics would do. But you can see that here, it is it doesn't look like it's fabric upon the bottom, the, which is cut out right now with a, a laser cutter, um, because that is the adhesive layer. They have uh, one roll of this combined material of fabric and adhesive. They cut it out and then the print bed will, uh, yeah, will now move up and grab the material and that will be done one after another for each layer you can see that it grabs the whole square instead of the um, only the inner cutout this is because that is used as a support structure so what you would normally enable on um, a 3d printer uh, on a 3d printer to get overhangs working here there's a heating element that makes the adhesive um, uh, yeah, make the adhesive actually uh, bond together. And this is now done layer by layer to actually create the object. You can see it here, new, new part of the um, layer, and now it's layered on top of each other. And at the end, you just peel away the support structure like you would do in a normal 3D print. And you get your, I think they are printing the Stanford bunny here. So we will wait that out. I mean, it's still not fast, like you can see it's 600 times faster, but it's it's kind of a way like 3D printing would look like at that point. You can see the peeling process here now. Of course, um, the possibilities here of getting finer structures are dependent on the material you're using. So this is not that fine, but um, it works to demonstrate it. But they actually show finer structures or courses structures in their uh, paper yeah and from that we are going into how to get that together so the embeds and the uh the interesting paper here is medley a library of embeddables to explore rich material properties for 3d printed objects by shen et al at kai 2018 so what they are trying is they say, okay, if you use normal 3D printing, you are um, you have the problem that the, there are not a lot of materials that you um, or that there are a lot of materials, but not uh, enough, so that you have all the possibilities of other uh, material um, yeah, features. So you could see that here it was um, uh, printed with a soft material, and they are now using a florist wire to make that more malleable and that it stays in shape. The interesting part here is that you can change a lot of properties by just embedding standard household materials. You can change how a contact works, so the friction, the malleability. Also, can you machine the um, the material in another way, like you could do pre-process -pre something like fabric? Um, the durability, deformability, strength, of course, the feel, and uh, the density, so the weight of the object. And I think after um, this, you will see how they change the weight of um, this is, by the way, their, their design space here that I'm now talking about. So they have a lot of uh, possibilities. Um, and if you change the density of something, you can make it uh, stand up more easily, uh, be resistant to getting pushed. You can change acoustic, electrical, optical, and thermal possibilities. So these are all things that you can change by just embedding stuff into your 3D prints. And um, you can see that here, the tool is enhanced with a sponge that they just cut out. So there's some of manual labor um, uh, in there, but you have 
directly an object that is way more what you try to possibly um, uh, think about when you designed it. Here you can see that what I was talking about, uh, the, the strengths of uh, the density um, when you push it. So um, they will show that multiple times here now. But I think because of the time, I will skip the rest of the video because they're showing now the possibilities of using the friction and um, using the other uh, ways of the material properties in the design space. This brings us directly into the part that actually is what the talk was telling you about, uh, stretching the bounds of 3D printing with, embedding tech, with embedded textiles by Rivera et al. at CHI 2017. So what they did was they actually used normal standard fabric and fabric design possibilities in their uh, 3D objects. And this is a fast video now. Um, what they did was they used it as a surface so that they could get more interesting patterns. They used it to actually get yarn to move objects. Here you can see both things, the moving in the background, but in the front, you can actually see that this is also done with the same possibilities like uh, being pressable, so uh, pressure sensing. Um, here you can see that they used the surface again, but also used some strings in between those objects to move them. And here's the pressure sensing slider, uh, and everything is based upon uh, just the composite of fabric and 3D printing. And you can see that, could see that in these in the flower, um, some of the things they use multiple times, so the basic building blocks. The interesting part here is that these basic building blocks have been defined by them. So you can see that depending on on which side of the fabric you print or which where you adhere the um, the plastic parts top, bottom, or both, you can get vastly different ways of being able to bend objects or having different bending possibilities in different directions. Of course, you saw that sometimes they glued it and sometimes they printed on the fabric. And this is, um, the difference here is that if you print on fabric, and this is important, um, you have some problems that could arise. If you put something on the print bed, like fabric, there is shifting. So you have to fasten it with um, something like a tape, or you can clamp it down. If you create something like the sensors they did, where they had the, 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 pressure, the, the, the pressure part was on the top, so the fabric was not on the bottom layer. It was in between some, at some point. They put it there, and then the printer printed on top of it, below it uh, before. They put it on there, print on top of it. You have to make sure that if the printer has to print on one part of the fabric that is not supported by other printed parts, you get sagging. So you have to um, make sure that there's material support there. Uh, also, fabric is, depending on the fabric you're using, it is stretchable. And stretchable fabric is not that good if you um, try to uh, get something, if you try to move above it while extruding something onto it because you will just get jagged uh, lines. So you have to make sure that you pre-stretch the fabric as much as you can do without destroying the fabric. And of course, tilting. If you print something on fabric, and we know that from 3D printers where you print a brim or a skirt so that objects don't topple over, uh, if you do that on fabric, you don't have something like an adhesion layer. So you have to make sure that that doesn't happen. So printing a lot on just a small layer is not that easy. That is connected to even more problems if you try to use materials which are not uh, compatible. Something like, um, yeah, let, let's say you use a fabric that is very um, coarse, so it is soft on the on, on the top, and you try to print on there. So there, there will be problems with the print head, there will be problems with um, the adhesion, and different materials uh, also don't adhere um, in the same way. So um, you have to figure out combinations of your printing material and the fabric material. Um, which also might make the fabric wear out faster if the printing material is too sharp and scrapes around, scrapes um, some parts of the fabric. You can change your G code, so the way the printer works, um, a little bit by changing the first layer height of the, so the, the, the contact that the nozzle makes with the fabric. 
um, which is uh, just make the first layer height a little bit higher so that it flows more into the fabric instead of uh, you you move over the fabric directly with the print head that solves some of these problems. But these are things that you have to uh, make sure. And then you can create these objects and you can, can create objects that can move. And the next paper, which is the last one I will go over, um, shows you that. This is Cloth Tiles, a prototyping platform to fabricate customized actuators on clothing using 3D printing and shape memory alloys by Muthu Kumarana et al. at Kite 2021. Um, and I will start it. I will let them talk. We present cloth tiles, an easily customizable and versatile fabrication technique to prototype actuation in on textile interfaces. Our method is a two-step method that first needs to print the desired shape on the clothing and then integrate the SMA wires through the flexible 3D printed substrate. We explored the aggregation, scaling, and directionality prospects of cloth tiles. During the co-creation design study, users came up with interesting designs. So here they use shape memory alloys. The last thing Oliver talked about, and also some parts of the question that we that he got afterwards, um, to use all the possibilities of printing on of combining the three D printing with the fabric or printing directly onto the fabric to get moving parts or parts that can be changed. And the idea behind using shape memory alloys here, instead of like um, showed before in the paper from Rivera et al, uh, pulling strings is that um, you to pull a string, you need an actuator, which is mostly motors, and motors are bulky, so you can't wear them. So the idea is to use shape memory alloys, which have the best uh, weight to strength ratio of any actuator. Um, because they are just, you can program them in a specific shape uh, by using a lot of heat. And then when you stretch them and you get less heat in there, they try to move back into their shape. So what you mostly do is using um, something like springs, because then you get a 50% uh, movement range. And you try to combine these with uh, candles that they move through so that you can pull them like the string by just putting current in there, because then they heat up. Um, you can see that here, they show specific ways of uh, moving fabric by printing linear, perpendicular, curved, circular, and angular parts and um, then actuate them. And it's uh, the actuation, of course, uh, gets, because it heats up the, the um, SMA, has some problems because you need to make sure that everything is heat shielded, but you can put it on the top or the bottom of the fabric. So you can decide there a little bit, you can wear other parts or try to isolate them. So there are a lot of possibilities to make sure that that works in uh, wearable fabric. And because we are now on the time, I will just stop uh, by showing you one interesting final part, because um, I think the most interesting part is that these things are not out of the ordinary research stuff that you could never do in 20 years. Uh, this is just a normal 3D printer that is in our fab lab. And we are printing onto fabric that if we fastened with, um, double-sided tape and we um, had to change a little bit because you can see that there's some small small problems a little bit of um, a curvature in there but we changed first layer height and at the end it worked out um, and we ended up doing an object that we can fold together so that we can put a mobile device in there and this is actually what I have here and I can actually fold that open Here, fold that open and show you how we did it. And this is interesting because you can actually get back between those two parts rather easily. Yeah, that's it, thank you. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.